All right, everyone, let's get things started. So I'd like to start by saying thank you, everyone, for joining. My name is Cody Armstrong, and today we're discussing the last year, uh, 2020, the improvements in some of the more advanced areas of Unshape. And so if you haven't uh, uh, watched our past webinar, we did one two weeks ago to the day, um, we focused on a lot of the fundamentals of, of on shape sketching part studios assemblies drawings and all the improvements in 2020 to those areas of on shape and so the idea behind this webinar is we wanted to dive into some of the more advanced features that exist in on shape and so we're going to dive into improvements around sheet metal surfacing configurations and a handful of other topics um, that i've that I picked that i think represent 2020 well um, so in this uh, webinar we we really just want to dive into you know, these various improvements and also ask any or answer any questions that you have. So please feel free to ask questions. There's a question section in the GoToWebinar control panel. Feel free to ask any question that you'd like, and I'll do my best to stop and answer the questions throughout this webinar. Um, one thing you'll notice with these improvements as we start to dive into things is there's a lot of usability improvements. So we announced, you know, things like sheet metal and configurations recently, and we've been making a lot of usability improvements just to, um, you know, maybe things like the interface or how you use various aspects of Onshape. And you'll see a lot of that throughout this webinar. A lot of the focus in 2020 was to, you know, usability of features. So let's dive into it. As I mentioned before, um, please do ask any questions in the uh, go to webinar control panel. So a few fun facts about Onshape. If you're new to Onshape, we update Onshape roughly every three weeks. Um, and so that we had 17 updates in 2020. So 17 updates from you know, January to December in, in 2020, roughly every three weeks. Over 400 improvements, and those are you know, not your performance improvements, but, but you know, actual fundamental changes to Onshape to improve how you use it. Um, also, as I mentioned, dozens of performance improvements nearly 80 drawing improvements. So um, a big focus on drawings in 2020. Um, and if you go back to the webinar we recorded two weeks ago, um, you'll see we spent a fair amount of time going over drawings as well. If you're interested in diving into any of these details further, there are really two websites or two links that I would refer you to. The first is the change log, onshape.com forward slash change log. And that's just a list of the improvements. It's very, um, you know, it's just very much a, a simple list. Um, if you're interested in a more detailed explanation of the functionality, I'd recommend checking out under the resource center, the what is new filter. Um, you can save the URL here. You can go to the actual resource center and, and maybe bookmark it. But that's where you'll get the what's new blog posts that give you um, the videos and things like that, give you a bit more context for the improvements. So those are two links that I would recommend, you know, bookmarking if you're interested in diving into the improvements, you know, that we've covered in the last year and of course all the improvements going forward. So just a few fun facts about Onchain. Um, let's take a look back at 2020 and really the goal here is to just pick out a few uh, improvements that I think will impact a, a large number, a large audience. Um, and so I've, I've picked out a few improvements in areas around sheet metal, surfacing, configurations, and a few other advanced features. And I'm going to go over some of those, those details in a bit. They don't necessarily fall under any one of those categories. Um, but the idea here is to, to kind of pick out some of the more advanced on shape functionality and some improvements in 2020 to it. And of course, as we always say with these webinars, we really encourage you to ask any questions that you'd like. So there's a question section in the GoToWebinar control panel. Feel free to ask any question that you'd like. So let's dive into it. Now, as I mentioned before, a lot of the, the improvements are, are surrounding you know, usability improvements and certain workflows that have gotten better in 2020. And Sheet Metal is a good example of that. Sheet metal, a lot of the improvements are around converting imported geometry to sheet metal. And there's a lot of small improvements that add up to a workflow that's dramatically easier uh, than it was or has been in the past. And so I want to go over a few examples of this, but the the best way to sum up the sheet metal improvements is, is a number of smaller improvements, things around, you know, how do we handle 
Um, I'll give you an example. Um, unfolding when you have bent inner loops, uh, like you see in this screenshot there. Um, better supporting mirrored bends, stability of mirrored bends. Um, improved stability when you have a cut that goes across a bend, right? So there are a few different examples. Um, and one of the one of the most important um, reasons to to focus on these improvements is because we get a lot of users asking, how do I convert my model to sheet metal so that I can unfold it in on shape? Maybe you have a library of sheet metal parts from some other CAD system. It's a very common workflow. Um, and so we really focused on areas that improved this. So I want to go over an example. Let's dive into it here. Bear with me for a moment, sheet metal import. So this is kind of a, a torture test, so to speak, for imported geometry and being able to flatten that geometry. And it's a common ask to, to say, okay, I've got this imported part. It came from some other system. I don't have the flat pattern, right? I want to be able to convert it to a sheet metal part in on shape. And so this has a number of things, like the bent inner loops, for example, or the cuts across the bend. And we also want to be able to create a mirror of this entity, right? And so this is kind of, as I mentioned, the torture test for an example of, of converting sheet metal geometry. And so there are a few improvements, but the big thing is, you know, geometry like this is now supported. So when I go in to convert the sheet metal model, I can select a series of faces, right? We'll flip the direction around here and grab the faces that are involved. But what's really unique is now I can define the edges or cylinders to bend and use actual radiuses from the model, right? Instead of converting these to edges. And that's what I see a lot of users still doing. Um, you can, of course, define more cylinders, um, or in this case, radiuses, radius edges to bend. And I can define these across a cut. Right, which is another important aspect. You can have a single bend that consists of more than one edge. Right, in this example, I have a single bend, but I have a cut through the middle of that bend. So the bend is one bend, but with two edges. And so things like that, little nuanced details like that, that make a, a dramatic improvement, especially in workflows like this, when you're converting to sheet metal geometry. Now this is, I should say, applicable to unshape modeled geometry as well, right? So these improvements are equally as useful on unshape models, but I think they're, they're very common when you're trying to convert geometry. So um, that is just a few of the improvements. Again, as I mentioned, a lot of the improvements in, in sheet metal were subtle and, and meant to just make it more robust as a tool for both creating sheet metal models and importing sheet metal models. All right, so let's dive into the next one, the next one that I have in my list, and that is surfacing. So the, the topic that I wanna dive into with regards to surfacing is the 3D fit spline. And there are a number of surfacing improvements uh, that I would mention here, but just for the sake of time, I'm going to focus on 3D fit spline because I think it's most uh, applicable and it's the biggest improvement with regards to surface modeling. Now, I would say a close second, close second place is the improvements we made to splines. But I, I focused on those in the first webinar, so I definitely recommend checking that out. Um, the ability to constrain splines directly without additional geometry being added was a big improvement. And it's an improvement to curves and splines, but of course curves and splines are the core of surface modeling. So I would say that is a close second, but the 3D fit spline functionality, the improvements to 3D fit spline, specifically the ability to select edges and, and use edges as a tool to construct fit splines, 3D fit splines, is a, an especially valuable tool um, when we talk about creating you know, more complex lofts and, and fill and other uh, geometry. So let me go over an example of why this matters. Um, let's dive into the spray nozzle. Bear with me for a moment here. Um, this is really about you know, the, the look and appearance of, of um, 
your lofts or your fills or those you know types of features where your the number of faces that you have and the and the appearance of the feature is very very important um, so i'll give you an example let's say that i want to construct a loft between you know the uh, handle here and the end which is of course um, a series of 3d fit splines and i can do this i can select surface and i can go in and choose profiles and I can even expand out and make a you know multi-selection profile, right? Like so. And I can choose another profile down here. And I can have a series of edges or 3D fit splines. In this case, it's a combination. It's actually 3D fit spline and just lines. But what you'll notice is, in this example, this is the preview of the loft, right? And I can tweak other things. Let's change the start profile to say match tangent, uh, get a little nicer look. But what you'll notice is the geometry that's underlying the loft very much defines the faces that are there, right? The edges that are created by the loft. And so in some situations, that may give you, you know, edges, faces that you don't really want, that you really don't want to see there. Um, and you'd rather just be one continuous, you know, the surface or face, whatever it may be. And again, this is really the result of your loft profiles consisting of multiple entities. So in this example, this is a loft profile that has one 3D fit spline. Then it has a few lines down here. These are just straight lines in a sketch. Um, and then another 3D fit spline. And so those lines end up creating contours in the loft that I don't necessarily want, right? Um, and so what I can do is I can simplify the geometry that I'm using to construct that loft by first converting it to a 3D fit spline, right? And so rather than use combinations of geometry, like this is a 3D fit spline, this is a line, this is a line, I'm going to take all of these things and convert them to a 3D fit spline, right? That will make them one continuous spline. So let's call up a 3D fit spline. And what you'll notice is the improvement is really this new edges functionality. So you'll see at the very top edges and you can define your combination of edges right? That will take that combination of edges and convert it to a single curve, right? So you see now I have curve seven. That's one continuous curve. So now when I loft between that and the other side, let's start here and go like this, right? There we go. Right. Now, you'll see I don't get those creviced faces that are were a result, essentially, of my lines, right? Um, so it, it gives me much more control over what the, the loft will do. Now, you can go to the nth degree and construct, you know, guides for your loft. And this is even a useful tool for that. If your guide consists of multiple splines or maybe a spline plus a combination of, you know, a series of sketch edges or edges of a model, you can use that to create one continuous curve. But think of any scenario where your, your geometry selections are creating these faces that you don't really want. You can convert that single selection of geometry, um, those multiple selections of geometry, to a single thing. Right? Now, uh, one question that kind of naturally comes up if you're familiar with, with Onshape is, well, what about composite curve, right? Composite curve is a functionality that allows you to take a combination of curves and sketches and edges and make it one curve. The important thing to understand is a composite curve is still, at its core, multiple things, right? So it doesn't really solve the problem of giving you one continuous edge for the purpose of a lofted face, right? Composite curve will make, you know, selecting that combination of things easier, but it doesn't convert it to a single thing. It just brings it together, right? And I hope that distinction makes sense, but 3D fit spline and the edge option actually converts, you know, the combination of selections that you're making to a single spline, 
right? And that's very important to, a lot for, you know, um, the industrial applications and, and so on. Um, but any kind of surface modeling application where, you know, the number of faces and the look, you know, are very, very important. So that is the improvements uh, to 3D fit spline. Again, the key to that is really just the, the um, edge option, right? Um, when I go to edges, you can see that is essentially the functionality that is new in 2020. Now, one thing I will point out about this is the, the underlying geometry needs to be continuous in some way, right, for this to work. So this will not um, simplify the geometry for you, um, but it will allow you to take what is already continuous geometry and convert it into a single entity. Very important, again, in lofted scenarios or um, guide curve situations when you need one continuous curve with what is a combination of things. All right, so that is the 3D fit spline. As I mentioned before, there are other improvements. Um, if you're interested in diving into any of these in uh, greater detail, please do check out those links I was referring um, to earlier. Let's go into configurations. So as I mentioned before, a lot of the improvements around these these functionality, um, these these um, new bits of functionality, um, is is around how we handle you know simple things like how do I show you what configuration is currently active, right? How do you change configurations? How do you rename variables that drive configurations, right? Because of the the domino effect nature of variables. You know, how do we make those changes easy? Um, and so a lot of the focus this year has been just on ease of use around configurations. Things like drawing improvements, display improvements in general, showing you what configuration you're currently looking at, making it easy to change configurations. Um, also rename improvements, specifically renaming variables. There are a number of improvements around renaming variables, but the, the one that I will really stress is you can rename the name and not have this downstream effect for anything that was linked to it for it need to be manually relinked, right? A simple thing, but when you go to rename variables, that can be a very big deal, especially if you have configured parts that are inserted into configure as assemblies. You know, there's a daisy chain of references that exist and renaming things can really cause headaches. So a lot of the configuration improvements in 2020 really focus on usability and trying to make it easier to use. So let's go over a few examples. And I'd like to start with drawings because in my opinion, this is probably the biggest improvement. Um, and it's very, very simple. But when we initially launched drawings, we didn't have an, e or uh, configurations, forgive me. We didn't have an easy way to show the configuration when you were in a drawing. Um, and so that's a pretty, Big deal if you're building a lot of drawings, right? If you're building a lot of drawings that are um, configured models, you want to know what you're looking at, right? What the configuration name is and, and other details. So one of the small usability improvements that I think can make a real big difference for a lot of users uh, is this ability to see what configuration information you're looking at, right? So when I open up this drawing, I have this in in this case this configured enclosure. I've just inserted a a you know simply a, a simple assembly view, and this is a configured assembly. It has several configured parameters, and I want to know what version, what configuration of this assembly am I looking at? And so the easiest way to do that is to now just expand out the sheets flyout, mouse over the reference for the sheet, and you'll get all the configuration information, including things like release date. Right, which is a really neat um, addition. So you get a lot of information in the sheets flyout that's configuration specific, and it just means that you don't have to open references, you don't have to to go to these great lengths just to figure out what configuration am I looking at. Right. So again, a small subtle thing, but really can make a very big difference. Now this goes not just for drawings. I think drawings is probably where it's most useful, especially if you're building lots of configured drawings, uh, but it also applies when you insert a configured part or assembly into another part or assembly, right? Um, and so I think that the other 
aspect of this that I would point out is the display improvements when we go to mouse over things in the subassembly level, right? Or anywhere where you've inserted a configured you know, part or assembly. So if you mouse over a configured part or assembly in the assembly, for example, in your instance list, you will see you know, the configuration details of that. Right? So it will display that as a, as a tooltip, essentially. And so, again, you don't have to open it. You don't have to view the reference. You don't have to do any of those types of things. You just mouse over it, pause for a moment, and all of the configuration information will fly out and give you all of the details for that particular configured part or assembly. Right? So, again, a subtle thing, but if you're working with lots of configurations and you're working with lots of different configurations in your assembly, knowing what is what is, is really important. Right. So that is uh, configurations and a few of the improvements there. Um, I think one of the biggest improvements, if I had to point to one, will be the, the improvements around variables and, and the renaming of variables. And so I'll give you an example. This is a configured assembly, right? So the user has the ability to configure a number of USB ports, Ethernet ports, you know, this double stack option, which gives you two layers. Uh, for the enclosure, and then you can define where the location of the antenna uh, is. So it's a configured assembly, um, and one of the things that people find, in, at least in the past, is when you build configured assemblies, you want to be very careful about the names of variables that you had defined. And the reason for that is if you change the name of a variable, it had this downstream effect where you needed to go in and manually replace references and rename things, so to speak, so that they matched the updated name. And so all this is, again, is another usability improvement. But what you'll find is in the configuration panel, if I do something like a rename, right, let's change, just change the name, subtle change here. Um, if I rename that, it doesn't have this downstream impact, right? I can go in and find, let's find the pattern that's driven by the ethernet ports, that's the one, right? And you'll find that the you know instance count is automatically updating, right? And so the variables, any, any place, let me try that one more time. We will rename to ethernet ports. There we go. And again, the big thing here is when you change, you don't have to go back and edit the variables, right? Um, for instance, for any other details, right? Um, a big change I think a lot of users really, really appreciate, especially if you have configured parts, right? So in this example, you may have you know configured parts that go into configured assemblies, and you want to be able to change a name at the lower level that will propagate to the appropriate place. So just a, 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 a you know small usability improvement, but I think if you do a lot of uh, variable defining for your configurations, this is a big deal, right? Not having to go back and manually update each is a, an important thing. Um, all right, so moving on, I wanted to get into a few of the other uh, more advanced features that didn't you know quite fit under a certain category. And ironically, one of those is categories. Um, so categories is is something that is largely about organization of metadata, right? So it's not something that easily fits in to anything that I've shown so far, but is a really important part of how you structure your properties, right? Your, your properties that display information about your parts, your assemblies, your drawings, or anything else. So categories, a brand new functionality in 2020, is a, an important part of how you structure your metadata. I'm going to go over an example of why I think this is so useful in just a second. But that's one of the things that I wanted to mention. The second is standard content improvements. This is something that is continuously evolving. So with nearly every update, there are changes in, in standard content. And I want to go over um, my personal favorite addition to standard content in 2020. Um, also... Custom tables. Custom tables is definitely for advanced users. It's an advanced feature for certain, um, but it really does allow you to do some powerful things. Um, one of the examples, one of the questions that I often get asked is, what if I want to take all of the parts in a part studio and you know add all the weight up, 
and give me a total weight. Right? And there are lots of ways you can do that, of course, but one u unique solution to this is using a custom table, right? Where you can use a feature script driven table to populate this information and you know, give you quick access to that in the Part Studio. And I know there are users out there who, you know, they want to see weight all the time, right? They don't want to go to mass properties or pre-select anything. They just want the constant total weight. Maybe it's some other factor. Maybe it's a center of, of mass or maybe it's some other thing that's really important. Well, you can build a custom table for that, right? So really unique um, functionality gives you a tremendous amount of potential but with a lot of things you know that involve feature script it takes a little bit of effort to to make it happen now there are a few examples of custom tables i will show you but you know know that this is really dependent on using feature script to drive you know what you want to see here all right so let's dive into each one of these So I'd like to start with categories uh, because I think that really has a, a very big impact on companies organizing metadata in Onshape. So the the problem that I want to you know put forth and, and the one that I think categories solves is how do we organize what properties are shown based on certain factors, right? And a good example of this is let's take this fishing reel. All right, let's go to the spool. This is one of the part studios, by the way. So the spool is just the, the top half, essentially, of this fishing reel. And I want to look at the parts and the properties for the parts. So I just right-click, I go into the properties, and I'm going to expand out the part studio and take a look at, at some of the parts. Now, the first thing I would point out is some of these things are, you know, maybe made by my company. Let's just say hypothetically I make this, and let's just say that I manufacture this bail arm. So we design, we manufacture that, right? But other things may not necessarily be designed and manufactured by us. Let's just say that, you know, the lock washer, well, that's a purchased part, right? That's not something that, you know, we release we don't have revisions of a lock washer. Um, we don't care about certain properties when we import and work with, you know, parts off the shelf, so to speak. So this, you know, part probably has different properties than this part, right? The bail arm, because we make this internally. There's release management, there's finish, there's machining operation. There's all kinds of metadata that we store for things we make, but things we buy have different properties. You know, they may have vendor properties or classification properties. And so how do we handle that? And so to before categories, before this release in 2020, you put all of it together. So you essentially had one giant list of properties. And the problem with that is, you know, if you have 30 properties for, you know, parts that are made in-house and we have 30 properties for parts that are made um you know, that we buy off the shelf. Now I have 60 properties you have to scroll through to find the ones that apply, right? And so the idea of categories is simple. You categorize your properties based on certain things, like, for instance, commercial off the shelf parts, a common phrase, COTS parts. I can create a category called COTS parts that shows only the properties that I care about, right? So maybe vendor or classification, right? This is a different set of properties than if I were to just choose part, right? Part will give me other properties that may not matter as much, you know, things like finish, you know, project number, um, part finish, I've seen machining operations, um, those types of things that you don't control with commercial off-the-shelf parts, but you do with parts you make, that distinction becomes very easy to delineate. You know, we make this, it's a standard part. It has the standard list of properties. We buy this, it has a different list of properties that must be, uh, must be filled out. Now, I use this as the example, but know that this is a very flexible bit of, of functionality. You can use this for anything. You can use this as just a way to categorize your... Um, your properties. 
So how do you get started? Well, you go to your company settings as an admin, and you will see categories on the left-hand side. And so you create a category, or you can change one of the existing ones, right? And you define what's the scope of your category. Well, it should include parts, assemblies, and drawings, but maybe nothing else, right? What's your name? Um, what parent, uh, parent categories and what properties should exist as part of this category? And so when this gets into really nuanced details is you can have categories with subcategories, right? That inherit the categories of the parent and then also have their own special subcategories or properties that you would fill out. Um, so to get started at a basic level, just go in and edit the existing parts or assemblies or drawings, or you can create new categories like I've done with commercial off the shelf parts and add the properties that apply like classification, for example, or maybe vendor, right? Those are the properties I care about if we're creating that, you know, COTS um, category, right? Um, so again, just a, a, an important piece of functionality for companies out there that are classifying their data um, accurately using, you know, the various meta metadata that's available, various properties that are available. You can now have various categories, right? Simplification around um, long lists of properties um, and just improve usability, not having to scroll through large lists of properties that aren't relevant to the thing you're looking at. Um, is you know a big win for a lot of users, especially those with large lists of properties. All right, so that is my first um, topic that I wanted to get into. That's outside of the um, just standard sheet metal surfacing and figure and configurations. Uh, the next one I want to get into is standard content, and standard content is an honorable mention here because it's constantly being updated. There's lots of changes. Um, going on all the time to standard content. Uh, but I always like to point out my personal favorite um, and why I think it's out. And this one, this time, um, in 2020, I think my personal favorite improvement to standard content is the addition of shaft keys to the standard content library. So if you do a lot of work with keyed shafts and keyed shaft combinations, you now have a standard content library of both parallel and tapered keys, right? That you can easily insert. So it works very much like you know any other um, standard content, right? You go to standard content, you choose the standard. They're ANSI and DIN standards. You choose the type, you know, key, parallel key in this case, and this in the component, and then choose your size, um, and and of course length, right? Now. The one tip that I have is much like any other piece of standard content, you can click insert, right? And that will attach that piece of standard content to your cursor. But the nature of you know, keyed shafts like this is direction is very important. And so if I mouse over where the center of this keyed groove is, where I want to position the keyed shaft, you'll notice by default it's actually wrong by 90 degrees, right? It's rotated at 90 degrees. That's just the default orientation. One tip that I have for you, just in general, when you're positioning standard content, um, this is particularly important when it position orientation, rotation is really important, is the use of Q to rotate, right? Um, a lot of people will insert that and then they will move it or manually edit the mate that constrains it, but you don't have to. Q will rotate that axis um, and it'll give you you know those 90 degree options really good in this scenario because i can just hit q it rotates 90 degrees and then i can you know place it right and i don't have to edit the mate after the fact so that's inserting keys um, into keyed shafts if that's a common workflow for you we now have the standard keys for both the ansi and din libraries that are integrated into standard content right all right, so that is standard content, my personal favorite improvement for standard content. As I mentioned before, it gets a lot of updates throughout the year. We're constantly adding and improving, um, but that is definitely one of my personal favorites. And I think one that gets a lot of requests. 
All right, so the final thing that I wanted to mention um, is custom tables. And this is definitely, of all the things I've discussed here today, one of the more advanced features that I'm going to show you. But it's really useful, especially for those that are familiar with feature script, right, and writing feature script. Um, and you've ever wanted to build a table into your part studio to you know, control certain aspects of it. So I'm going to give you an example of, of how this works. And I'm also going to show you where you can find custom table examples. So you can get started um, with using these. So I'm going to dive into a part studio here. And what I want to do is launch the custom tables flyout. So on the right hand side in your part studio, you will see custom tables. It's important to stress this is for part studios, right? Feature script runs in the part studio environment. So I click custom tables, and you'll see here I have this option to add custom tables. Now, now, custom tables allow you to view information from the part studio that's defined using feature script. So if you're not familiar with feature script, it's a programming language that Onshape developed that allows you to essentially build custom features, right? In this case, actually view information in the part studio using feature script. And there's lots and lots of use cases for this. And if you're interested in just getting started and you want to try it out, what I'd recommend is click Add Custom Table, and on the left-hand side, you'll see Custom Table Samples, right? These are just a few samples that have been publicly published, right? And you can go in and add them to your custom tables, right? So I can choose, in this case, I'm going to choose the Feature Script Part Masses uh, Table, right? So I choose Part Masses Table, I choose the table here, and it adds that table to my custom tables file, right? And so now this is a feature script driven table that essentially lists the mass, right? Based on materials that I've chosen and then totals them up. So now I can see at any point, if I make any changes to this, that this total weight will update in real time. Um, now, there are, of course, other ways you could do this, but the neat thing about this is it's a table file. You can leave it open. It updates in real time, and you don't have to go to the mass properties. You don't have to pre-select anything, um, and this is just one example. There are dozens of, of um, useful examples that I've seen, a, few, a handful that have been posted there um, that really make this very flexible, right? So that is the custom tables. Um, really useful, especially for those that are uh, interested in feature script, have written custom features in the past, or just interested in any of the publicly available ta uh, tables that others have posted, right? Um, so really neat stuff, a lot of potential. Um, and I think hopefully you'll see this library of table samples grow, much like the custom feature library has grown over the years. All right, so those are the improvements that I set out to show you today. Uh, I am going to stick around and answer any questions that you have. So if you have any outstanding questions, please feel free to type them in. Um, I have one final thing that I want to mention. Bear with me for a moment here. Um, jumping back to my slide deck, going forward, if you're interested in learning more about Onship in general, I definitely recommend checking out the Onshape Learning Center. You can find it at learn.onshape.com. You'll find self-paced training, instructor-led training, technical briefing, certification. It's just a huge resource for all learning materials regarding Onshape. So definitely recommend checking that out if you're new to Onshape or you want to dive into some of these more advanced areas. Check out the learning materials we have available at Learn dot on shape dot com so that's what i have i am going to stick around for a few more minutes and answer any outstanding questions so please feel free to type them in but that's it everyone thank you and have a good day